Before the Red Cross came to Tarboro, um, we have a close group of teachers at Tarboro High School, and so really they took the lead on establishing almost like a makeshift shelter. Um, our superintendent certainly opened the doors to Tarboro High School, but the heavy lifting was done really just by staff. Um, and so being a small community, everyone kind of stepped up. And really it was just word of mouth, Facebook, texting, um, and everyone certainly eager to help assist in any ways. So created a donation site there at Tarboro High School, and then um, when the Red Cross came, kind of worked with them to see that through. Um, so some immediate things are just making sure that the students that we serve and their families know that we're aware. Um, so immediately all the staff started texting the parents and the kids and just making sure that they were safe and that they had space and they knew about resources in the area. And really we were hoping that once that storm passed that that was it for us. Um, and really it was really ironic because although it looked beautiful out, that Tar River kept rising. Uh, and so certainly that's when the real devastation hit the community um, in terms of Princeville and also in Tarboro. And so that was the immediate need of trying to make sure that people were getting proper communication in terms of evacuating, but also trying to save what they could. Um, with speaking with our school specifically, we did um, we put a team of people together on Sunday and just literally moved everything we could from the first floor to the second floor. Um, and the school, although the surrounding houses were not all saved, the school, there's not a drop of water that got in. Um, and really, I do believe we have a very prayerful staff, and I just genuinely believe that it was a blessing to have the school still be the same because many of the kids just were you know, shifted from their homes and their locations. And so it was nice for them to at least have one stable thing to return to, and that being the school. So we still have a lot of kids that are displaced from their home, whether living with um, loved ones or still staying in hotels um, in Rocky Mountain and Greenville. And kind of what that re-entry process looked like, working with uh, Teach for America. And we brought our staff in, and our instructional coach was good enough to work with our um, guidance counselor and they created PowerPoints for the staff but also for the students and so we had multiple days set up where kids came in and we did a lot of circle talk and we wanted them to understand the timeline of the flood and you know we use words like cresting and you know to a child they don't really know what that means and we wanted them to be able to speak the vocabulary so that they would understand kind of what happened to them um, so that they could be a part of the healing process as well. Um, and it's interesting because based on where we serve kids, there were some students that experienced total devastation um, and were evacuated from homes. Some students had some mild flooding. and Some students realistically were just out of school. Um, so having those open dialogues to build empathy in our classrooms and with our teachers certainly was helpful. Um, we partnered with other schools where they actually came in and they sat with our kids and we did everything from think tanks to how do we prevent this from happening again to just story sharing of sharing some hardships um, and really trying to get the students to, to build compassion with each other. Um, currently, you know, we're still facing a lot of the stressors. What has been the hardest for us is that in the past, students, you know, middle school, we have changed in hormones and we're emotional anyway, you know. They come to school one day, they're really happy. They come to school another day, they might get upset about something. And so to just know that this is an age in which kids are changing and then compounded with the fact that they don't really have a space anymore that's theirs. Um, specifically, I'm thinking kids that are living with other relatives or in hotels, that them losing their bedroom space is what we hear a lot about. Um, so now you're sharing beds with moms or with brothers and sisters. And so everything from sleep quality to just being able to decompress. And so what we've created here is, you know, trying to emphasize our family atmosphere. So when kids come here, you know, they have a shoulder that if they just need a hug, you know, they can meet with us, but also that they're empowered to build some, some key things here. So for example, we started Power, which is, um, happening right now, very cool. And so our kids get to choose when they go to lunch, when they go to clubs, when they go to tutorials. So there's a lot of power in that because there's a student choice. Um, so for example, if you want to create a club, certainly the only thing you need to do is have an adult that's willing to sponsor it. And so just having them be able to come here and have a voice when it feels like maybe a lot of things happening to them has been helpful. Um, this morning, for example, a student came down. She was upset that she had heard that they would be evicted from the home that they were able to move into after the flood. And I think that our kids hear a lot, again, just proximity with sharing space with adults and certainly carry burdens that they don't need to carry. 
And so she came into my office this morning. We talked for a while. I talked to mom, and she said, instead of going back to class, can I help out in the resource room for a little bit and just kind of think? And so she was able to key into the student-created resource room and help fold clothes and just kind of catalog. And But it's nice that they have a voice to say, this is how I'm feeling, and that this is a possible solution that I'm bringing to an adult. So they have an element of control here. We had um, only a few that moved, and I think, unfortunately, we're going to have more next year. But really, that's just because of the fact we were able to bus this year. And so a lot of families, if given the opportunity, would rather stay here than to uproot. But we did have families that decided to make a significant move to Virginia or South Carolina and just relocate completely. We have about 16 being bused in, and it's mostly Greenville and Rocky Mount. And essentially, it's this helpless feeling that our kids are going through right now, where you know, and they'll verbalize, I don't want to feel this way every time it rains. And so I think that that's traumatizing that a natural event such as rain would be something that actually causes them an intense fear and anxiety. Um, so we talk a lot with the teachers about making sure that if a child does do a misbehavior that we're correcting the behavior and not necessarily the child and speaking to the kid to let them know that, you know, when you make this action, this is the consequence. Um, but having kids feel more understood, too, of that we get it. Um, and just trying to teach our kids more to vocalize. I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling frustrated. Because a lot of the times we don't have those feeling words. It just comes across as I'm angry. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, I don't think they are angry. I think that they're frustrated and confused because they've went through great loss. And then from an outside perspective, even though I live here in Tarboro, go to church here in Tarboro, work here in Tarboro, my home is not affected. Mm -hmm. And so there's a part of us that want to continue as business as usual. We know our kids are have an achievement gap, and we're working really hard to close that equity gap. And it's difficult sometimes to balance in terms of how hard we're trying to push these kids. And the reality of the fact is just mentally and cognitively, some are not in a space where they can take on that additional stressor of business as usual. Um, I think overall, when they came to school, they were much busier mm -hmm. in terms of it looked like um, like staying still almost or being in classes all of a sudden was like, did you notice that, you know, it just seemed in general they had more energy. Um, and so as a response to that, we created some additional, you know, dance teams, outside kickball teams, um, intramural basketball teams. So we're trying to respond when we can actually see. So seeing that kids are having a hard time focusing is certainly a behavior we can acknowledge. Um, but the emotional behavior has kind of come in waves. And surprisingly, all of our male students we saw act out first in terms mm -hmm. of being frustrated and being angry. And it really is only recently that we've seen a lot of our female students come in crying. Um, and so just an emotional difference in terms of how the majority of our male students have handled it and the female students mm -hmm. is an obvious difference. Um, I believe we're playing catch up. And I think that there are unique programs that exist um, for example, the Northeast Leadership Academy through NC State, they talk a lot about emotional intelligence and the importance of a, of school leader to address some basic needs mm -hmm. um, before we're asking teachers to, to do the heavy lifting with the cognitive skills. Um, and I think that it has never been more apparent of that until you go through something like this when you realize that it, it needs to be a taught process um, because I, I think adults, we process and handle things at a much greater speed and are able to kind of hide those things. And for children, I don't think that they know even the uh, right way, you know. So just trying to be transparent with our staff of saying, these are some things we're going to need for us to do and we're going to learn together. And it has been a difficult process. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, when we look in general, just low-income areas, and what we know happens to kids in low-income areas in terms of just growing up with adverse childhood experiences, um, it would make sense to me that areas in low income would be funded greater in terms of having more access to guidance counseling and mental health resources. Uh, and I think that's something where most of us struggle in terms of being in a low income area, opposed to maybe a place like Raleigh that has a, you know, a greater access, if nothing else. Um, Specifically, you know, money becomes an issue. Um, everything in terms of transportation costs to our ADM changing and being held harmless and those kind of aspects. So I think that there's a lot that could happen in a response, but certainly as a proactive level. 
I think just engaging in kids cognitively in terms of the, how they come to school, they're not necessarily school ready. And if they had additional support in mental health, in guidance counseling, you know, K-12, I think we'd be in a much greater space. Um, but essentially when something as, as large scale like this happens, it's all hands on deck that everyone kind of becomes a guidance counselor. And, you know, like you said, we provided support, but that's us working with Teach for America, reaching out to Neela, um, Googling <laughs> of like trying to find our own ways that we can support our staff and students. And so if there was something already created, I think that would have been beneficial. Um, I do commend though our staff for the work that they've put in. They've really tried to kind of flip the script and try to make sure that kids were empowered to do something in spite of this storm. Um, so one thing, for example, um, our seventh grade teacher, Miss Simmons, she was talking with her kids, well, you know, what could we do? And one of our um, rising eighth graders was talking about how it was frustrating that everyone kind of came to see the water rise, but when they left, like the water left, the people left, and there was just trash everywhere. Um, and so he arranged a whole adopt a block and we took the seventh grade out with their gloves and bags and, you know, did street cleanups, went door to doors. And so there's been a lot of ways where kids have been able to make an impact. So we're trying to get them to see that this is something that happened, you know, to you, but it's, this is not going to define you forever. You know, we're trying to build that resiliency so they can say, you know, when I was in middle school, this event happened, but it just became like a speed bump. Mm -hmm. That's not where I stopped. Um, and so it's been inspiring to see just the kids kind of bounce back as well. I think it's just important to recognize that we're not done yet. Um, that even though, like you said, the months have passed, that we're not back in our homes. Um, the children certainly aren't done processing the issue. And just the fact that, you know, there is still uncertainty in terms of FEMA and money and where kids are going to live and where do they go to school next year. And, you know, I know we focus a lot on the students, but when you take a macro approach, you know, this is entire counties that were completely devastated. And so I think it's very easy as an outsider to assume that because the waters have now went away, mm -hmm. we're okay again. Um, and the reality is that's just not the case. Now, I think it's been really interesting to see kids um, become empowered to help. One of the things I want to show you guys is our student resource room. Um, and it started as an act of kindness where last year, if kids were kind, they could go in and pick an item. And that was something that uh, students had read about um, somewhere in a journal that they were studying. And so certainly overnight, the resource room became an active working resource room um, where we had kids that, you know, the parents would call and say, we could send them to school, but they don't have any clothes for the next day. And so kids were actively able to outfit their classmates and say, you know, just come, we have stuff. And so kids were all texting each other and trying to get them to come just because, you know, we have clothes, we have backpacks, um, we have food. We have a partnership with Calvary Church and some other local churches that every Friday we give about 86 families food bags for the weekend. And so I think our staff and our students have really become responsive. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's going to be interesting to see kind of long term when the students are older and reflect back on the different experiences they've had due to the flood, what their outcome is going to be. I think it'll be interesting.